This is the second installment of a 10-part offering here on Tuesday. And it's kind of an experiment. I mean, this is, this is uh, we're going to be talking about the Eightfold Path, which is the Buddha's foundational teaching. Um, and it's kind of an experiment for Tuesday night because we recognize people drop in, drop out, you know, and there, we, it's really not the place to do anything sequential. So uh, there'll be a number of teachers teaching, but we've all promised we'd do a review each week of the total Noble Eightfold Path so that anybody who just dropped in will be immediately brought up to speed, so to speak. <clears throat> um, so last week, Sharon, I believe, gave an overview of the path. And tonight, I'll give a, a shorter uh, overview. And then we will take a look more specifically at one of the, one of the path factors. <coughs> and uh, I, uh, excuse my coughing if I go into that. I have a little bit of a cold plus all the plants are having sex and it's like all over the place and that's just the way it is, so. So, the Eightfold Path. After the Buddha awakened and he had practiced for those six years very intensively and he kind of figured out that there's this thing that's more of a middle path than these extreme aesthetic practices which really are kind of self-mortification and damaging and then on the other end there's this kind of lazy kind of do nothing and he kind of developed what is now known as the, the Eightfold Path. But when he had his awakening he really pondered for a time as the myth goes about whether he would try to teach this. Um, he had discovered a level of nuance and subtlety uh, in his understanding of how basically nature works that he felt, oh my gosh, this is going to be really difficult to explain to people and some people are just, most people are not going to be interested and those that are, it's still going to be difficult. And he certainly had the, the the opportunity just to continue with his practice and lead his life and etc. But um, he decided after some contemplation that he'd give it a go and try to teach this stuff. And he taught for 45 years, walking around in mostly northern India um, and teaching to various groups of people from illiterate peasants, rice farmers, etc. to royalty in certain tribes that he encountered. Um, and so he was developing a pedagogy that um, was constantly in refinement so that he could speak to the different people that he, that he met along the way. So his very first teaching after he made this decision to teach was the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. These were like the, the pith instructions. When he, <coughs> excuse me, when the Buddha had his awakening, there was a, a, a whole lot that became clear to him. And there's all the mystical, schmistical stuff, you know, of rebirth and all that kind of stuff and world systems being born, etc. cetera. But, but that's not what he taught. He didn't so much care about that. It was like, okay, here we are on earth. We're all born. What's the most important information that could serve people the most? It wasn't, it wasn't sitting around philosophizing on the beginning of the universe or the end of the universe and were you a prince in the past life or a murderer or a whatever. That was not of his interest. And so the Four Noble Truths were the first teaching. And so very briefly, the first truth 
is that suffering does exist. Everybody here knows that. You know, when you get born, <clears throat> there's going to be challenges. All the natural challenges, old age, sickness, death, loss, losses of all kind, all kinds. That's, that's really the deal. That's part of the birth package, the fine print that we all didn't read when we took birth. And so we're working our way through a lifetime. I have, um, I have housemates, Steve and Amy, and they have a little girl who's now been with me and us for, well, she was in utero when they moved in, and she's two and a half years old. And so I see her every day and get to play with her. And when I look at her sometimes, I think, oh my gosh, <clears throat> all that she will encounter, you know. And her parents are great parents and totally doting, but there is no way that she can be protected from all that's coming down the pike. If she's lucky enough to live into adulthood, she's going to lose those parents. She's going to lose a lot of people dear to her. You know, there's going to be changes that are going to happen in the world and around her and external conditions that she cannot control and she will not like. You know? Nobody escapes this, even little Mary Louise, who now when you look at her life, it seems kind of idyllic. <coughs> Although there are times when things are not going her way. <laughs> and we know about that, and the external conditions are not the way she wants them, and she has not yet learned any real mechanisms to working with that other than letting everyone know in high decibels that things are not right. So. So this business of uh, uh, suffering, you know, this first noble truth. And I can remember, and I've, I've, I know I've told this story before, I was on retreat and I had a, up in Massachusetts, and I had a, uh, an infected tooth. And I had to go get it removed during the middle of the retreat. I had to go down the road to the dentist and... <clears throat> oh, it didn't come out, it came out in pieces, and then it turned into oral surgery. And so, so there I was at night, not able to sleep. And I thought, well, feeling a little sorry for myself and trying to give myself some loving kindness, etc. And then I started thinking, I'm not going to sleep tonight. This isn't going to happen. There's too much happening. I didn't want to take, take the pain stuff. I wanted to see what, what I could do. But I went through every person that I knew. What was their suffering? For some, it was health. Some, it was the worry over their children. Some, it was economics. Some, it was relationship. You know, I, I couldn't find anybody I knew who was on some kind of a glide path without suffering. You know, it's just so true. So. And of course, there's incredible joys in this life. You know, that phrase, a thousand joys and a thousand sorrows, is really it. And if we're lucky, we get some kind of near balance. Some people aren't that lucky. There's just sorrow after sorrow, you know, and born into very challenging places. And it's very, very difficult. And for some of us, we actually get some moments of appreciating and being in this awe-inspiring creation, this planet. It's just absolutely magic and beautiful in so many ways, you know? And those of us that are lucky enough to have friendships and love and connection in whatever forms they come, people, pets, etc. I mean, this being human is a miracle. There's so much joy here. And there's all the other stuff. You know? So the second truth that the Buddha talked about, and he basically talked about these for 45 years. <coughs> and I know some monks, the only talk they give every, every time they give a talk is the Four Noble Truths. And kind of that's what we do. You know? And the, sec the second one is, the second truth is, 
hey, there's actually a cause of this suffering. I mean, we get this certain pain in everything that comes with having a human body and all that kind of stuff. And that can all get exacerbated by grasping and clinging. And we can look at grasping and clinging as if there's something that we really like and want and we like and we want to hold on to it and we hold really, really tight. But we've all noticed we got born into a place where everything's changing. So we hold really tight and it's like holding on to a rope and, and something very powerful is pulling it through our hands. We end up with rope burn. It hurts because nothing stays the same. You know? So it's kind of learning about grasping. <coughs> clinging. The other side of grasping and clinging is very similar is that when things are unpleasant and we're just kind of thrashing and trying to make them pleasant all the time, that can get exhausting. You know, because we can't. The external world won't cooperate enough. And certainly people don't cooperate enough. They seldom do exactly what we want. They sometimes do, but they sell, you know, we can't control anybody. So, so grasping in any form that it appears and kind of attaching ourselves like one of those sucker fish on a, on a shark or a big fish, um, it just flies in the face of nature. It creates discord. And the more that we hold and grasp, the greater the discord, the unsatisfactoriness, the suffering. Yeah. But it gets better. I mean, the third truth is, hey, there's a way out of suffering. There's an end to suffering. That there, that there is. This isn't like some grim deal. You could also say these are the, are the four noble truths towards happiness towards freedom. And so the fourth noble truth, well, it's like, of course, the end of suffering is loosening our grip a little bit. Our, our, our strong grasping and attachments on certain things. You know, and, and you've probably heard it. If you, if you can learn to let go a little bit, you're going to have a little bit of freedom. There's just more freedom in there instead of just trying to manage everything. And if you can actually learn to let go a lot, let be, allow, then there's tremendous amounts of freedom until you're really not sticking so much to anything. You're experiencing everything fully, love, loss, grief, etc. But there's not that kind of intense suffering that comes with grasping the way that we're capable of grasping. And so, the fourth truth is that there's a path out of suffering. And that's called the Eightfold Path or the Noble Eightfold Path. And that's what this series of talks are about, the fourth noble truth. That there's actually a path that's been practiced for thousands of years and if we pay attention to the factors in that path, we're going to have less suffering. It's just the way it works. And there's eight of them. And I gave you all that little, that little sheet. Um, and usually they're presented, in, and I didn't like this when I first saw them, the translation of the Pali word sama. <clears throat> it always turns out to be right. And that just felt a little feels a little Orwellian or the big brotherish or something. There's a right and a wrong and a it's a little creepy when I first I felt a little creeped out by it. But the the actual um, translation of sama is a little more nuanced than that. It connotes wise. So a lot of people will say, well, wise action, wise view, etc. Or wholesome is another connotation. Skillful, ideal. 
and Sama also describes something that's, that's co coherent and complete. So that's, that's a little more nuanced than write this and write that. Um, so I wanted to just check in with you on that in case there are those kind of reactions, which I totally get. So they're, they're not to be taken, the word right is not to be taken as some kind of commandment or anything like that. And more like a, uh, you know, the phys physician's prescription, you know, there is suffering and, there, and these are ways to alleviate that. So you've got right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. But before I get into them a little more, it's important to understand that they, they don't really fall out in any linear way. That it's, they're not progressive steps to be mastered. Like, okay, now I'm going to get my view in line, then I'm going to work on my intentions, and then I'm going to clean up my speech. You know, that's not the way it works. They're all, it's designed so they're all practiced together. They interpenetrate and support one another. And, and strictly speaking, there is no first or last step. Um, and the, the, the eight steps of the path, um, you can break them into three categories. There's those that have to do with wisdom, and we're going to talk about right view tonight a little bit. And then there's right intention. Those are the wisdom factors. And the ethical conduct or the personal integrity, those are the, okay, how are we treating each other? Where's the harmony in our life? You know, how are we speaking? How are we acting you know, towards others, towards the environment, et cetera? And is our livelihood in line with that in some fashion? You know? And those are interesting reflections. And then there's the mental development part. That's the meditation stuff. What's the right amount of effort to give to that? Too much, we get tense, too loose, we kind of slide all over the place. You know, what's the appropriate effort? What's the, what's, how, what, what is mindfulness? And how do, we, how do we utilize that in cultivating our heart and our mind? And the word concentration really means that, I don't even like the word concentration. Samadhi is the Pali word. And that's, that's a way bigger concept than just being able to focus your mind on something. Samadhi has all these other factors, beautiful factors. And so um, when you're in Samadhi, you can't harm any of You can't really harm anybody. There's an opening of the heart. There's a kind of generosity that comes forward. When you're concentrated and you're a sniper, you can do harm. That's not samadhi. You, have, you, have, you may have the skill to pull your mind together and concentrate, but samadhi includes so much more. <clears throat> this is a quote from uh, Ajahn Sumedho, who's, who's an American, he was born American, and then he spent, I don't know, four decades practicing in Asia. He was a monk. And um, he says this, in this eightfold path, the eight elements work like eight legs supporting you. It's not like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on a linear scale. It's more of a working together. It's not that you develop panya first, which is the wisdom, the Pali word for wisdom. And then when you have panya, you can develop your sila, which is the word for personal integrity or ethics. And once your seal is developed, then you will have samadhi, which is the, the meditation part. That's usually how we think, isn't it? You have to have one, then two, then three. As an actual, as an actual realization, developing the eightfold path is an experience in a moment. It is all one. All the parts are working as one strong development. It is not a linear process. We might think that way because we can only have one thought at a time. So, uh, 
I want to talk a little bit about right view. And paradoxically, you know, I've just, I've just gotten done saying, well, there's really no beginning and end to this. But it's also been said that right view is the beginning and the end of the path. So I've kind of reconciled that in my mind, and it makes sense to me, that none of you here would be interested in any of this stuff or interested in the kind of depth of yoga or tai chi or other things that you're involved in if you didn't have some wise view. Something that said, well, you know, there's something here that I'm going to check out. Something to kind of get you to make that first move. Many people, of course, don't have that initial, gee, I'm kind of interested in what is all this about? Why have all these people of different religions and different spiritual paths, what are they doing? Most people don't have any real interest in that, but you do. You come here, you could be sitting at home watching whatever's on TV or reading a book. Uh, so there's already that wise view, that kind of exploration. And of course, part of the other wisdom factor is the wise intention. That's kind of the energy factor. You know, that has, that kind of gets you up off the duff. And reading a book, taking a course, learning some, some practices. So, so that's the beginning. There's some semblance, some modicum of wise view. Now, the reason that it's the end is that it's never the end. Your perspective on world, on life, on the nature of suffering, on the nature of yourself, that's refined all through your life. Think of how you thought when you were a kid. And for some of us who have been here decade after decade, how you thought when you were 20 or 30 or even 40. And for some of us, even 50. You know, it's like, oh, I thought that? No, I've, I've refined that a little bit. So it, the, the wise view is in constant refinement. So in the beginning of a spiritual path, you know, and in this one we always say, well, you don't have to believe anything. But it's another paradox. But you kind of have to have to offer a provisional okay, I'm going to try this out and see what the benefits are. You know, so there's a provisional belief in that, hey, this seems to have, millions of people have said this is of some benefit, so I'm going to give it a go. And I'll withhold my judgment for a little while until I try. You know. So this wise view, <coughs> excuse me, helps you get going. And then there's this whole path that gives a kind of supportive framework of these other different aspects of investigation, reflection, and refinement that keep supporting that view. So, but there is a specific um, Buddhist understanding of what wise view is or perspective. And that's an individual or a practitioner has developed over time what you might call a discerning or a penetrating insight into the Four Noble Truths and the three marks of existence or the three characteristics of existence. <coughs> now, three characters, characteristics of existence one is impermanence. Okay. To, a, a wise view contains an understanding of impermanence. More than intellectually. And that's why when we practice, we're looking at how things change. How are things changing in the body? How are the emotions changing? 
sensations, thoughts, change, 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 internally and externally. We're watching it in ourselves, everybody around us. So that's one mark of existence. We all share that it's all impermanent. I can remember being on a retreat, a 30-day retreat with Lee Brasington, and one of the things he had us do was, okay, in between your sitting meditation, go out and think of something that's permanent, and then come back and report that. It was interesting. You know? Well, you might have something that's permanent, but... So, and then the other mark of existence is suffering, and we talked about that a little bit and about grasping, and there's a cause of it, and there's an end of it, etc. And the third mark of, <coughs> excuse me, of existence is the selfless nature of phenomena. What does that mean? Okay, That's a big topic and an interesting topic. But it essentially means that we are not separate, independent selves. We can't exist we don't. We're not solid, independent selves. We are connected into everything. We are exchanging air and pollen with our environment all day long. You know? We have been raised, schooled, taught by a legion of people. All the clothes we have on all the people that made those clothes, all the people that designed the, the shipping containers and the boats and all the stuff to bring them to us, we are not separate by any way or means if we just look at it. Every morsel of food that comes to us, we can trace back to the origin of the universe and the sun, the rain, the nutrients in the soil, all those people who grew it and packaged it, etc. So the selfless, selflessness of our experience, we might at times feel totally separate and embattled and up against everything, but on a deeper, repetitive reflection, that's not the case. And so as we discern and penetrate these marks of existence, we actually can move below the conceptual, intellectual understanding of that. You know, it's not about get, being able to stand, sit up here and talk about these things. It's a very personal and intimate insight into each of those. You know, how deeply do I feel and see and experience impermanence around me and in me all the time? And how do I see the suffering when I'm listening to NPR and the news and the, the, the kind of greed and wanting and attachment and fear and all the things that are involved out there? And in myself. And this separate self, what an illusion that is. I am so connected into everything, this vast web of existence. You know? It's like I remember a Zen, uh, a Zen teacher was dying. I think he was, in, he was in Chicago and all his people came to him. Oh, please, you know, we're so grief stricken. And he was dying and he says, well, what? Nothing happens. You know? It's all happening and nothing's happening. You know? It's... Uh, it's all so connected. You look deeply subatomically. What are we? You know, you get into the inside of an atom and the subatomic particles and all the, you know, just kind of vibrating space. Our eyes are so crude. You know, so, so that, that deep, intimate penetration of those three marks of existence, that's a wise view. And so that is cultivated over a lifetime. You know?
Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen teacher, says this. Our happiness and the happiness of those around us depend on our degree of right view. Touching reality deeply, knowing what is going on inside and outside of ourselves, is the way to liberate ourselves from the suffering that is caused by wrong perception. Right view is not an ideology, a system, or even a path. It is the insight, <coughs> it is the insight we have into the reality of life, a living insight that fills us with understanding, peace, and love. A living insight that fills us with understanding, peace, and love. I like to look at these uh, three aspects of the Eightfold Path on our, little, on our little sheet here. I look, I look at them as a virtuous cycle, and it's one of my favorite ways of depicting the path. A vicious cycle, we know. Everybody gets that. You say or do something that makes a mess, and then you tighten up, your perspective narrows. Your wise view is not available. And then you say or do something even worse. And it just tightens and tightens and uh. Talk about suffering. That's a vicious cycle. What this practice does, these three elements, the wisdom element, the personal integrity or ethics, you know, and the mental training, they work together in this beautiful, virtuous cycle. So when we look at our personal integrity, what's our speech like? How are we treating people? What are our actions like? Really, is our livelihood not harming? If we're refining that and working on that on a daily basis in our relationships with the world, we're going to have a little greater peace of mind. And that's a lifetime. We also have this other course that's going on now, the precepts, where we're really looking into the aspects of that. But that, too, is a lifetime of refinement. So <coughs> we're cleaning up our lives little by little. Then we're doing these trainings, these, these mental and heart trainings. If our life is a little cleaner, we're able to go a little deeper in our meditations, in these altered states of consciousness, of deep relaxation and clarity. And the more we practice, the deeper they are and the clearer we're, we're feeling. And out of those comes the wisdom, the insights, the understandings. Now I get it why that relationship is a mess. Now I get it why that's not working with my kid or whatever, or my dog, or whatever. <coughs> so that's an insight. We take that insight and it further refines our speech, our thoughts, and our actions, which then kind of calms our life a little more, which then allows us in our mental training to go even deeper, which creates even greater insights, deeper understandings, impermanence, suffering, What's the nature of self? You know, and then that informs our day-to-day -day living. So it's a virtuous cycle. And the, and, the, and the more we invest in it, the deeper it just takes us. And it doesn't end. The perspective gets refined. The view, the understanding gets refined. And this is what the Buddha was trying to encourage people to get involved in. And so when we look at these different path factors, all of them are important. They really are. And uh, it's not so easy at times. But there it is, your noble eightfold path. So tune in next week for another review from who's ever going to uh, speak. And I'm not sure who's teaching next week. 
And I think they will be talking about intentions. Everything is on the tip of intentions. It's a fascinating exploration. So thank you uh, for attending and good luck on your path. <laughs>